Welcome to Idea Collider, a regular podcast hosted by me, Mike Rea, uh, where I speak with the people who I regard as the most interesting within the pharmaceutical space, or I talk with the authors of the books that I've found most interesting on the subject of innovation. So, uh, enjoy. Delighted to welcome Ricardo Zaccone to, uh, uh, to, to, to the podcast. Um, for one of our first ventures into non-pharmaceutical innovation and uh, and, as, and the lessons that it has for uh, for our industry. So, um, first of all, Ricardo, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, Very nice to be here. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about you and um, and um, uh, and what got you to today? Yeah, well, first of all, I do probably the opposite of pharma in some ways, which is basically games. Uh, because I, I co-founded the company King that uh, created Candy Crush, that was our most popular game, I would say. And uh, before that, I worked in uh, in tech for for quite a, for quite some time. And before that, I worked in consulting. I worked in consulting for about eight years. Then, uh, in 1999, when uh, when tech uh, was suddenly coming out of the you know of uh, of the initial phases and became more popular, I joined a startup that uh, was called Spray, where we launched uh, one of the largest internet portals in, in Europe, basically a competitor to Yahoo, just to give you an idea. And uh, we went from 20 people to 800 people in one year huh. uh, before uh, uh, having to sell. This was in 2000 when the stock exchange crashed. Uh, before faltering fundamentally yeah, because we didn't make money. We were had a lot of users, but uh, we didn't make much money. And so we had to sell it to Lycos Europe. And then after that, uh, we didn't make much money from the sale. But uh, uh, after that, I, I, I came over to London. I, I used to work in Munich before. In London, I joined an American venture capital company called Benchmark Capital, where I worked there with a very strange task called Entrepreneur in Residence which was one of the most stressful years in my life because I had not really something to do. The only task was to come up with a new business idea, which is quite stressful when uh, <laughs> you go to the, to the work and you don't have a concrete idea to work on. Uh, but I developed quite a few new ideas. And one of, the, one of these ideas was to launch online dating in Europe, which at the time was not, uh, not present in Europe. It was only available as a free service, but not as a paid service. So why would you launch it as a paid service when... It's available for free. Yeah. Well, that was basically a new idea. And uh, it was actually a good idea. And instead of launching a new company, we ended up investing or we ended up basically proposing to invest in an existing uh, dating company. They made me an offer to join a company called Udate. So I spent some time there before doing King. Uh, it was not a very long time because shortly after I joined the company to build up the business in Europe, I, uh, the company was acquired by an American company called Match.com. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, I had to restart again the thinking process, saying, okay, what do we do next? And then we decided with my former uh, partners from uh, the first company, from Spray, to launch King. And we started with six people, and uh, it took some time, and uh, uh, we went almost bust a few times. Uh, and we were completely disrupted, for example, by Facebook when Facebook came out. So we had to reinvent ourselves mm -hmm. and think, how can we bring our games that before were available on the web to Facebook first and then later to mobile? And uh, it was a very painful process. And after this reinvention process that took us out, took about nine, busy overall, two and a half years of reinvention process. But before we launched Candy Crush, uh, it took many, many years and more than 200 games because we funded the company in 2003 and we launched Candy Crush in 2012, um, so many years later. And uh, we went from six people to about 2,000 people and uh, we IPO'd the company on the New York Stock Exchange in uh, 2014 uh, for ultimately a valuation of around $7 billion. Wow. So it was, it was a really going from, from nothing to something that was, and through many, many difficult phases, was an interesting experience. Interesting. And then we ended up selling the company ultimately to uh, to Activision in 2016. Oh, interesting. So, what was your inspiration for King? Where, where did that come from? What did you, you know, want to do? What did you think the world needed at that point? 
Well, it comes from two things. It comes from what the world needs at some point, but also from, you know, with whom you work. Mm -hmm. And so when we did spray was a very interesting, uh, very important experience in our lives because having a portal, we had all the different content channels there. So not only we licensed the search engine, but all the other vertical channels like dating, like games, et cetera, were channels that we developed ourselves. So we developed within Spray the first free dating application in, in Europe, or one of the first applica free applications. And that's where I saw that without having much money for marketing, suddenly this, this application was taking off. And that's where I had the, the thought, okay, but you know, if, it, if there is usage there, is there a way to monetize this? And, then, mm -hmm. and that's where I looked at, okay, what's happening outside? abroad and that's where I saw that there was there were companies like match.com that were actually monetizing it. Mm -hmm. So that was the inspiration for that. In games, we developed games before and we had very we had a lot of success with games where played a lot, but they were not making money. So we were thinking, okay, is there a model where we can still use leverage our our experience in developing games together with a model that actually allows us to to monetize these games. And that's where basically the thinking came around uh, uh, around how what to launch next. Uh, and so I think that also my experience when we create games, the most important thing is not how you monetize. The most important thing is usage, mm -hmm. is to understand whether whatever you come up with, whatever product you come up with, it's interesting for the user to use. And so in, uh, in games, for example, the way to quantify this and to tr understand whether it's useful or not is to look at the so-called day two retention. Mm -hmm. day two Retention means how many people that install an application today and start using it today are coming back tomorrow and use it again tomorrow. And in the same way, then you look at day seven retention, how many people that came, uh, that installed the game seven days ago came seven days later and, in, and continued to use the application or use the application seven days later. Yeah. And that's the key metric. And if this metric exceeds specific values, so X percentage of your users come back on day two, on day seven, on day 30, that's when you say, oh, wow, we have something here in our hands that is really attractive. And then you can think about, hey, is it monetizing at the right level? Can you monetize it? In what way can you monetize it? But that's the second part of the process. So with, um, so when you're sort of designing a game, what would be a, a typical percentage of, of kind of day two you know, retention, day seven retention, is it, you know, is it in the single figures or do, do, do games have typically high retention numbers? Well, let's say anything that is above 40% day two retention is considered as good in games. Mm -hmm. uh, and Candy Crush was considerably above this number. Uh, so Candy Crush was an exceptionally good game. And that's uh, where we then uh, applied all our knowledge. So yeah. what we say, for example, in, in games, but this actually applies, I think, more or less to most products in tech, is that it's a mix of art and science. Uh, so the art comes in because you, you, unless the idea is new and is really different from what is out there, uh, it's very difficult to break through in a world that is extremely competitive. The only way to break through is marketing and then it becomes really expensive. The more different uh, the idea is from what is available out there, uh, the more distinct, and of course, the experience has to be exceptionally high, exceptionally, exceptionally good, the easier is then marketing. So, and, uh, and Candy Crush became a combination of all of this, meaning the design, the idea itself was based on a popular play, uh, play, uh, play uh, modality, which is it's so called match three, where you match three, uh, equal, 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 let's say, uh, uh, stones, for example, and then they disappear from the screen. So it's a very well-known way of playing so that the user knows how to play. But then how we proposed it was completely innovative so that you had actually to go on a, on a parkour and on, on, a, on, a, on a path and play with others. And the beauty of the game, the quality of the game was very, very high. And so the, the, the fact that it was new, that the quality of the game was very high, and then we had also a model behind that was refined in terms of monetization, innovating also on the on that model. Uh, it's called so-called freemium. So the game is completely free; it's very accessible to everyone because you can play the game, you can finish the game without having to pay. But if you make more than three mistakes, you have to wait. And if you don't want to wait, then you have to pay or you have to invite your friends. So either you monetize or you give us free marketing. Fundamentally, this was basically. Um, 
giving it an edge that allowed us to market, to do marketing. And then we were extremely good also at understanding everything we do, we, we measure it. So also in marketing, we understand basically the value of each user, how much we can afford to pay in marketing. And then uh, we started basically doing the, applying the chessboard strategy that you put uh, one, uh, you know, one, one, uh, one dollar on the first, on the first uh, chess, chess board, on the first the square, and then you see how it works. And if it monetizes well, then uh, you apply two dollars on the second, on the second, on the second square. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it continues to monetize and you control every time how each category of users, how each segment of user is actually monetizing, if it's continuing to monetize at the same level, um, then you can you can continue with this. So on the third on the third uh, square, you then you double up again. So you go from one to two, from two to four, and then from four to eight, etc. And that's how we ended up from spending from very I would say relatively little before before launching Candy Crush to spending about hundred million dollars per quarter in marketing without having to raise any money. Interesting. So so just to help us um, kind of draw parallels, so. Uh, I guess first question is: Was Candy Crush one of you know hundred games that you launched, or was it, or was it, you know, was it the one that you were betting the company on at that point? No, well, you know, the innovation happened over time, and was the 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 sum of the learnings of all these years in the past. Hmm. So it's not something that happened overnight. And we developed with the previous model more than 200 games, which were very shallow games, which you were playing in competition with other players. Mm -hmm. And um, when uh, we then got disrupted by Facebook and we had to think of, of a new way of bringing our games, we developed much deeper games. And when we did that, we, took, we looked at what games we developed before. Mm -hmm. And we took the games that were most successful that were more attractive for our users. And then we started reinventing the way how you would play these games, mm -hmm. making them deeper, working and innovating around the business model, and then ultimately also innovating around the marketing around it. Mm -hmm. And in all different phases of the entire value chain. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so the, we didn't launch 200 uh, games on Facebook or 200 games on mobile because we launched the other games before on the web, which were much cheaper to, to, to develop. Mm -hmm. And then when we launched these games on, on, the, on, uh, on Facebook and on mobile later, they were fully connected games, so multi-platform games. Uh, we could basically immediately focus on the genres that we knew were more popular. And, on, and then Candy Crush was a combination of games that we actually developed earlier, uh, together with some innovation on top. Hmm. So had you sort of predicted that it would be the success or were there other games that you thought it would be more or we thought successful? after a while, you know, you get experience with what you do. So we thought it would be successful, but before launching the game, we had no idea that it could become so successful. Hmm. And, uh, you know, often you only know when you launch a game, whether the game is working well or not. No, and yeah. then the difficult thing is not when the game is not working. The difficult thing is that when the game is kind of stuck in the middle, that's where the difficult decisions are. When it's working okay, -ish, yeah, but it's not great. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's often painful to decide that we need to actually kill the game, to cancel the game and not launch it. Uh, because despite having spent a year or two working on the game, it's actually not good enough to get to the top 10 or top mm -hmm. 20 in the rankings in, on a global scale. Interesting. And, and, and again, just to try and um, calibrate. So when you launch a game, is it complete? I mean, is, or does it evolve from, from, from that point? Uh, when we launch a game, it has to be already pretty good. So you can mm -hmm. miss out on things like, you know, specific, you know, you, you can refine a lot, mm -hmm. but you don't do major jumps in, mm -hmm. in retention. You don't do major jumps in monetization afterwards. Uh, mm. But especially retention is the key, is the key one at the beginning. So mm. we try to launch it in a way that already we can understand whether the user loves the game or not. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, we spend a lot more time afterwards, after having launched the first prototype or the first, the first version of the game. But already the first version of the game takes quite a bit of time. Yeah. And in terms of development timelines, so from kind of, you know, initial sketch or initial idea to 
the product? How, how long would you normally expect? Well, strangely, you know, usually it depends how good the first throw is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, often you, you, the, best, the best games are the ones that take actually not the most time to develop. Okay. Because you develop them, you launch them, and they're already, oh, wow, that's amazing, that's good, and now let's, let's make it much better from there. Yeah. While when you're kind of stuck in the middle, that's where you spend a lot of time because you still hope that you can actually take it and make it better to an accept to a level that actually you can still compete uh, mm -hmm. and make it much better. Uh, so I think in Candy Crush, if I'm not wrong, I think it took us about a year to create the game for Facebook, so to be played on a computer. And then it took us much less. It, I think it took us about six or seven months to, take, to bring it to mobile. Uh, because it was the same game, but making it multi-platform. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a beauty. So it was a really beautiful re-review or re reinterpretation or, or port of the game to mobile. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so and then when we launched, when we, we first launched it or we first developed it for iOS. But uh, when we saw that we were not um, promoted by Apple, we immediately ported it also to Android, and that was actually very very fast. In fact, we did actually very few technical checks, in fact, it, because it was immediately developed uh, because we wanted to launch it as soon as possible. Okay. So okay. it took us about, I would say, from inception to launch on mobile for about a year and a half. Okay. About a year and a half, a bit longer. Yeah. And and how many people would be involved in a development team for, I mean, let's say, Candy Crush? Well, when it starts, it's a relatively small team with around, around probably around 10, 10 15 people. To launch it on the web plus another similar team to launch it on on mobile mm -hmm. uh, but then when it became a much bigger game and we had to and now you know, we have several candy crush teams now so we have a, we have more than 100 people working on the game okay and what kind of ip do you own in a in, a, in, a, in, a, in that industry do you, do you own you know inventions next to the game or to the monetization or is, is IP not the most important thing? No, IP is important, but IP is especially around the characters, is around the, the design of the game. Ultimately, it's very difficult to protect IP mm. on the in the in the core gameplay mm. uh, of the game. So the the, the 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 you can spend a lot of time litigating, but it takes time. So we spend mm. more time on uh, we focus primarily on marketing the game when the game is good. And making sure that the game becomes very, very successful before competitors. You know, Candy Crush has been imitated many, many, many times. So there is no time to think about the legal aspect. Of course, we immediately, you know, we we also did that. But I think that the, the main strategy is not to focus on uh, on uh, on yeah. on the on that side. It's it's it's, the, 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 it's, it's all about market share. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the kind of Facebook disruption. Um, and this all feels like history now, but can you tell us more about, you know, pre-Facebook and post-Facebook uh, King? Yeah. So pre-Facebook, we developed a, a, a uh, an offering where you would play a one-level game against other other players, and then there would be a winner and, and a loser in this game. A very short game, games which were attractive for a very hardcore audience, an audience of passionate players that are extremely good usually at playing and are very competitive. The downside of this model was that it was a narrow offering. So an offering that was not attractive to everyone. It was not very, a very relaxing way of playing. And we had a segment of users that played a lot, but, but it was not a general, a general interest offering. And when we thought of how do we take our games later to to Facebook first and then to mobile later, we reviewed this and we made our games less competitive. So suddenly you would still play with others, but it would not be in a win-lose situation. It would be more in a, uh, uh, I can see where the others are along the path. Uh, mm -hmm. And we would play together rather than against each other. There would not be a winner and a loser. And we would make the games also uh, more relaxing so you could play each level over three minutes, but uh, uh, you can basically leave the game there. You can continue again at the end, you know, whenever you have time. Hmm. 
and uh, and um, and also the model would open up. You would not have to pay before playing. You would basically you could play the entire game for free, as I said earlier, basically with uh, specific mm. connotations that if you want to uh, play immediately once you have made three mistakes, or if you want to have some, uh, uh, if you want to try again in, in the level where you where you missed, then you can uh, you can you can pay a very small amount of ninety nine cents. Mm. So in all these changes, then suddenly. Uh, allow the game, the core game, that was a very good game, really to unfold its potential and to reach hundreds of millions of users. Mm. We had at the peak, we had about half a million, half a billion users playing the game every month. Wow. So, so if you look back in hindsight, you'd see Facebook as a kind of important pivot in the, uh, in the journey. Absolutely. It was key for us also because it allowed us suddenly to uh, allow a modality of play with others uh, that before was very difficult to offer because mm -hmm. Facebook opened the platform to other to to other developers, which meant we could use the Facebook graph, basically the fact that people are already connected, to enable uh, uh, the game to be played with all your friends, without mm -hmm. having to invite all the friends because they were already connected with you on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So That's they true. just had to download the game. Yeah, and and with the advent of iOS and Android and, and so forth, has that had another you know um, sort of shift in? in yeah, that was again a massive shift because suddenly with uh, with a mobile device you didn't have to go to your computer, you would have the 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 device where you can play every day with you at any moment in time, mm. and uh, that changed many things. On one side, it made the the, the games even more accessible. Uh, and also the user interface was even more intuitive because you didn't have to use a mouse, you could use your fingers. And, uh, and, and on the other side, also marketing became much more effective because there was no media break. So we, 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 we did not only digital marketing, we did also marketing on TV, which was very effective for games. And then when you sit in front of the TV, you have actually your phone. So while you watch TV, many people use their phone. I use my phone all the time. And then I could basically people could play the game, install and play the game while they were watching immediately after having watched the the advert, uh, mm -hmm. while they were still sitting on the sofa, rather than having to remember the advert when they were at their at their computer maybe the day after. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I want to come back to the, the bit about learning, you know, because because I would call what you have described as a sort of a learning organization, a kind of asymmetric learning organization. Clearly, the feedback loops between you know, wanting to gather information, gathering information, doing something with it, are very short in in you know the, the kind of companies that you've described. How would you describe your approach to sort of you know organized learning and, and product? Development? I think there are a few things that are, I think are really important for for innovation and for learning. I think that innovation and learning go hand in hand. So it's very rare that you have the breakthrough innovation that comes from zero. Uh, so usually innovation comes from observation and observation of things that work and things that don't work. And observation is only relevant if it's based on more disruptive trials. If mm -hmm. you don't try anything new, it's very difficult to have observation that's really relevant. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think innovation is a mix of having in place all these measurement tools, mm -hmm. really to be able to measure what is the impact between cause and effect. And, and how the impact is and what is relevant. And on the other side, also a adding to that a culture, which is a culture of trying things that are disruptive. Mm -hmm. And so, and for that, I think it's really important that you have a culture of uh, where making mistakes is part of the model. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, if you have a company where whoever makes a mistake is immediately penalized, no one will try actually to make mistakes. No one is going to try to reach for the moon. No one is going to try to do something that is not already validated. Mm. But if you try nothing new, then already something is validated. You, it's, it's impossible to have innovation, impossible to have learnings. Yeah. And so you need to establish a culture in the company where making mistakes <sighs> is okay, is good, is, is actually very good sometimes, as long as you try to do something that is innovative. So I'd be trying yeah. to dig into that because it, you know it's it, it's it's a phrase that we hear a lot. You know, I think that Pharma has heard it from tech. You know, this idea of fail fast or whatever. But the 
the idea of a company that's comfortable with failure, I mean, it's, it's certainly in pharma, I think we overuse the word failure to describe experiments where you didn't get a positive outcome. And I, I don't think, to your definition, that wouldn't be regarded as a failure in a in a kind of learning organization is to, to try something that that you learn from, but you know, that you don't take forward is not necessarily a failure. So I'd be interested in, you know, how you build a culture where well, you, you know, you, you want mistakes, you cultivate them, you learn from them. Well, you know, interesting now I'm a bit putting my toes into pharma because I set up hmm. a um, in a foundation in the in which where we where the focus is to develop actually drug for rare, for a specific rare, specific rare diseases, uh, the P10 uh, Research Foundation. And uh, the interesting thing is I'm noticing some differences between pharma and tech, mm -hmm. one of which is that in uh, is the, the cycles are much, much longer mm -hmm. in, in pharma than in tech. The, the risk is, is much longer in... Uh, in, uh, sorry, the, the risks are, are sometimes much bigger in, in, in pharma the further down it goes of the route of, of validating mm. uh, specific parts of the, of the, of the product chain. Mm. And, uh, and, and I think also the biggest risk is that if, I do, if, I, if we make a mistake with a game, no one actually really dies. Well, if you make a mistake in pharma, uh, then uh, it, it can be really, really bad. That's why I understand mm. all of this. But while in... in uh, in, uh, in tech cycles usually are basically my business plan was always three years uh, and, and, the, and the cycle for product development is usually one to two years. Um, in uh, in uh, the business plan we have now for the foundation is 10 years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but also there, I think we we're trying to have a similar approach in terms of, in terms of uh, testing uh, or having m m many, many different uh, products in the pipeline at the same time with different uh, with different time frames, and also there we are aware that many of the things we will do will or might not work, mm. and there's nothing wrong about that. We know that as long as, of course, we try to keep the cost as low as possible mm. and try the mistakes at the beginning. But uh, we are trying to do something that actually no one has done before. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to develop pharma uh, products that no one has done before, as well as in the pipeline, also some other products that we're working on that actually are much more uh, likely to work uh, because they're based on repurposing existing drugs versus coming up with an entirely new drug. Mm. So have you tried to replicate the kind of culture within this venture? Were are you going for a kind of clean build? Uh, within the within the healthcare space, absolutely. I think that uh, the the first the first part is to bring on board the best. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts with the team. In my opinion, you have to bring on bring on board people that uh, have done it before, that have worked in the pharma industry for for many many years. That's the different key difference, for example, between pharma and tech. If you want to disrupt in tech, you can actually come from a very different area. Mm -hmm. I think in pharma, my uh, what I saw from having checked off, you know key connotations of successful pharma, pharma developers, uh, you don't think, you don't, I mean, you, can, you cannot make it up. So mm. I brought on board a team that were, where people have been working in the area for more than 20 years mm. and, and in, in drug development. First of all, the team. The second thing in terms of culture, uh, uh, we have already set busy the, the, the expectation that many of the things that we are working on will not fail. So we will fail. Mm -hmm. We'll fail, but... Uh, uh, but the important thing is to try, let's try to see whether we can uh, uh, understand as soon as possible whether something is working or not. And let's try to measure uh, everything we do. Hmm. Um, so within, within King and within you know, P10, the, the idea of failing fast uh, you know, is, is, is a phrase that we, that we, that we hear from, from, from tech, from Silicon yep. Valley especially. Could you elaborate on what that means to you, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, learning quickly or you know, failing uh, by design? I think that for me, the key thing is giving responsibility to the team to define mm -hmm. what failing fast is. Mm -hmm. Because if you fail fast, it's not necessarily a good thing. 
-hmm. because often you you need to really put your best effort and really so for me the most important thing is actually to see that the team gives everything that they have they go through all the different options before they fail Mm -hmm. Uh, so fail fast for me is not per se something that is worth it achieving Uh, if you can fail fast and have and you have done everything you can do to make sure it works then i think it's good then it's successful yeah 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 then it's a then it's a good feel fast if you feel fast because you know i tried it you know we're done done but you haven't really thought of all the different aspects so for me one thing which i learned previously in consulting is that purely by thinking you can actually think two steps ahead of all the of all the possible issues and and i think that that is something that that, that i think I, I i expect from teams that they really think of all the possible aspects of it uh, mm-hmm. If it's in games about you know how to, what what kind of potential uh, gameplays can we use? In what ways can we propose it? How can we make it, make it innovative? Uh, that they understand uh, what what also also the world around them. About also, they also understand the users, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if we are talking now about the, the world of, of, for example, of the foundation, that actually we go through all the different possible strategies of what we could do, and then we decide specific strategies after having basically taking in consideration all the possible aspects of it and if mm. something doesn't work then to really try to see why has it not worked mm. and and try to make sure that we do everything we can to make it work yeah. if then it doesn't work hey great then you know we we, 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 we canceled one possible path so we can focus on the others but what yeah. have we learned from there that is actually useful for the path going forward mm. yeah and i'm interested because you, you mentioned a, a number of metrics that you would put next to learning or a kind of dashboard for you know, product development within within King. Um, did you find that you had them all in place when you began, or did you find that you were missing certain kinds of signal, or you know, did you find some some of the metrics were way more useful to you than others? I think we had them in place pretty much from the moment when we started in mm-hmm. everything we did. Mm-hmm. So when we started with six people, we had specific metrics in place that were useful for what we were doing at the beginning, mm-hmm. but to immediately understand actually what uh, what works and what doesn't in what we do. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, what we had at the very beginning when we were six people was very different from what we had when we launched first on Facebook and then also very different again from mm-hmm. when we launched on mobile. But every time we launched something, we didn't just have the product. We also had the metrics and the tools in place to evaluate if what we were launching was actually good, was working or not. Because hmm. one of the things that, uh, that strikes me is, do you find that there are experts in that world who you go to and say, look, is this a good idea or is this a good idea? Because of course, obviously one parallel in, parallel in pharma is that we do tend to you know, rely very heavily on the role of experts to say yes or no to you know, something working or not working. Uh, does that same situation exist in in tech? Well, I think that I think that after a while you get a feeling for what might work or might not work, especially if it's something that you see in front of you that you have seen before, mm-hmm. right? So if you see something that you have seen before, then you can say probably with higher reliance, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. If it's something new, if it's really new, you can still voice your opinion but you might be very wrong about it mm-hmm. uh, so uh, there was for example a game that was a, one of the guys who was working for me that 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 he launched and he launched it on on, on his own and he said and he, he, I, I saw it I saw the first prototype of it and said mm, I don't really get it and it became massive mm-hmm. so so yeah. I, I was completely wrong yeah. and uh and sometimes things we the, the games we develop where we thought actually this would be work really really well actually didn't work because yeah. it was new and until you launch it you actually don't really know if it works or not. Yeah, and and is it that kind of combination of you know the the monetization model, the kind of the, the stickiness of the game, the the retention? You know, is it is it you know is it a combination of those things or is it often one key driver? It's all about adoption it's all about adoption mm-hmm. it's all about whether the the game is attractive to the user or the application is attractive to the user and now basically i after having sold uh, king uh, we set up with my co-founders a, uh, a venture sorry a an angel fund where we invest only our money called sweet capital 
And so we there we invest in in, in many different new ideas, all mobile. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I think we're trying to apply our our first of all our feeling, but also um, of course that when there are metrics, also understanding the metrics. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting to see actually what you think might work that actually does work or does not work, and in what degree it then works. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's it's yeah. very interesting. So is because you've had a chance to look at the sort of pharma and healthcare space, you know, what do you think are the you know the real opportunities for innovation within within our world? Well, I think I think for me it was very interesting to see what happened now with uh, with COVID. Mm -hmm. The suddenly cycles that were 10 years long got reduced to one year. And uh, and so I I really challenge the existing structures mm. to reduce the time required for approvals for mm. all the spaces that are that time. Mm. So I understand when you have specific tests that need to happen, then you know the time is, is what it, it what it takes. But I am sure that there are dead times which you can reduce, you can compress massively, including the approval times. Uh, so for example, we were discussing a few a few weeks ago that for a historic review of uh, data, so historic data of uh, of patients, it would take us two years to busy process this. I said, how is it possible? This in my business would take us, you know, a month maybe. Mm. If uh, if it takes a long time, a month maybe maybe six months. Let's be generous, six months. Mm. But uh, two years, and the, the reason was behind that. There is a lot of approvals which need to be which which need to be. Uh, be basically asked for we need approvals and the data is, is contained in different buckets and every every time you need to or ask different organizations and it takes two years so and i think that uh, you know if you want to move fast and that's where you can you know the positive thing is that these these improvements can save a lot of lives so there is a real concrete benefit it's not just launching a game faster this is about saving a lot of lives uh, by by reducing these dead times and so I think this will be really my, my challenge to pharma. What can we learn from what happened in COVID? What these companies have done incredibly, amazingly, you know, the impossible. We launched a rocket to Mars in, in, in one year, fundamentally. Uh, well, what can we learn from there? Yeah, no, I think it's a really important point that um, I think a lot of the questions that get asked in pharma are usually, what does it, what do we usually do? Or how long does it usually take? Not long. Not how long could it take? And, and is there a way to change that? And I think I do think that we've had a, you know, a bit like your Facebook disruption moment with uh, with with COVID this year. I think we've seen some of the sort of changes. Um, aware that time is sort of getting 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 away from yeah. us as well. Um, uh, as as well as yeah, but, but if, if, if if I may only say one thing, one last consideration on this. I think that it's also challenging the paradigm that to develop a vaccine takes 10 years mm -hmm. because if to, if you start from the part from the from the assumption that to develop a vaccine takes 10 years it will take you 10 years mm -hmm. if you then say actually no we don't have 10 years we need to develop a vaccine within a time frame of one year mm -hmm. then uh then suddenly the entire organization and 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 all around you need to think differently and that's mm -hmm. how i think uh the, the, the this incredible impossible target was achieved challenging yeah. challenging the pre the, the the assumptions yeah yeah, and that, that I think has been one of those generally fascinating years. I mean, you know, the, because people talk about Moderna or BioNTech as kind of overnight successes, but they've been ten years in getting ready to be an overnight success. Uh, and I think, but somebody... also, but also AstraZeneca. I thought it yeah. was really, really interesting how they managed to reduce. Because I, I spoke to many Pangelos and how you managed, they managed to reduce from 10 years, the development mm -hmm. process It's more difficult when something is established in an established and very successful company from 10 years to one year. Yeah. And then also a strategically position it in a way that you also plan of how can you develop something, a vaccine that can be distributed easily afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that's strategy. That's not mm -hmm. anymore just product development, it's all strategy. How do you develop something that can actually can be distributed uh, without all the issues? Yes, yeah, and, and I think I know when uh, 
when we're on the panel uh, with, with with many. I think that idea of strategic priority is important. But as you say, I think that idea of what best means for a vaccine is uh, has been critical as well. The idea of uh, you know is it portability? Is it the ability to store it in a, in a normal fridge yeah. instead of a, you know these these things are uh, fundamental to product design. Um, so I've got one question for you before we sign off that, uh, that I didn't uh, advertise or, 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 or give you a taste of ahead of time. Um, book recommendations. So, so what, you know, what do you read for inspiration on innovation in, in, in general? Um, well, interesting. I'm not, actually, I'm not re I'm reading. I have uh, several books on, 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 my, on my desk now that I don't manage to read uh, enough of them. Um, there is one book that I'm reading now that is not very much about innovation. In fact, it's about it's the it's a Michael, a Michael J. Fox book that he wrote about his his experience and what he has done with his foundation. That is yeah. very very inspiring, and that's the one that I'm currently reading. Um, and then I bought another book. I don't have down the title in, uh, in my mind, but basically it's about the experience of a psychologist who was in a concentration camp. And so his writing of how he managed to stay positive and think, you know, in a positive way, despite being in an environment which was really uh, where very little hope was left for the people in the in the concentration camp. And so that's in the book which is is still I still have to read, but another book which 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 so is book that a bit not necessarily about innovation. I think if if you read personally, I I get very bored very fast by books on innovation. I try to read books that are in a completely different area. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I do the same. I think usually the first chapter is enough of all of the books on innovation um, before you start getting into these uh, interesting case studies. Um, that's fantastic, uh, Ricardo. Any, any anything that you wish I'd asked you before we before we sign off? Anything on P10 or your your next five no, years? It was fun. Or, yeah, fantastic. It was fun. I'm currently I'm currently in the process of finding out basically what I want to do uh, in my in the in the future. So. Besides, or the, the projects, but of course, I'm doing that are, for me, very, very important. Yeah. And if people want to find out more about the foundation, is there, is there someone where I can direct them? Oh, yeah. It's uh, p10research.com. Sorry, no, apologies. p10research.org. Okay. And p10 is P-T-E-N, obviously, but any, anyone who works in pharma knows, so. Yeah. Fantastic. Ricardo, thank you so much, and uh, good luck. Thank with you the so much, Mike.